Hello and welcome to episode 23 of Establish the Collection. I am Cody Main, joined as always by my co-host Gary Hartman. Gary, episode 23, it is our MJ episode, our LeBron episode. Big shout out for all the sports numerology bros. <laughs> <laughs> uh but but a bit of a sobering night for you gary how how are things going on your end uh yeah man been better as far as you know from a sports fan perspective my new york yankees tonight were in the one game wild card let's let's just call it a play in game let's call it what it is it's not a playoff game but they were in the one game wild card against of course the Boston Red Sox and what I consider to be the best and biggest rivalry in all of sports. And they just fell completely flat. They were not MJ. They were not LeBron tonight. They were not, they were not even, um, they were not even Derek Williams on the Knicks that for some reason that was the next 23 <laughs> I can think of. But speaking of my Knicks, it is time. I'm wearing a New York Yankees hat right now. Um, they are eliminated. They were woeful. I hope they fire Aaron Boone tomorrow. I hope they clean house tomorrow, but you know, who was not woeful and eliminated tonight and who had their first game of the season, their first preseason game, and was a beautiful victory in Madison Square Garden. And that is my New York Knicks. So the Yankee hat is off. I'm throwing it. It's gone. The Knicks hat is here and here to stay. And um, I'll be at the Garden soon enough. And I'm just pumped for hoops, man. We're, we're, we're grinding away in the ETR streets, getting ready for, for the season-long season, for the DFS season. So NBA around the corner. And that in the NFL is where my focus is at now. There's no doubt about it. Uh, a, a great visual for the YouTube audience as you switch hats and and fittingly as we kind of switch gears, even though even though the MLB is is heating up into its postseason. That's and true. We'll, we talk just have, we, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. I'll give you your your 15 minutes in the spotlight for some MLB talk. But man, uh, as you mentioned, NBA streets are heating up. NFL obviously is in full swing. MLB postseason. Uh, uh, promises to be fun at least uh we'll, yeah. we'll see how oh, things, definitely we'll see It'll how things fun. go there but i mean you can't really argue with october baseball so very excited very very excited for the sports world and the hobby at the moment but but i i can't let this go without mentioning my sport my sport the ufc we've got some upcoming cards that are absolutely loaded you've heard me talk about it we've mentioned the giveaway on previous episodes we're at 89 reviews on itunes so we're really close to the 100 giveaway and again just in case you guys are unaware we've got the the double kamzat chamayev silver base prism rookie card giveaway when we hit 100 and as long as we hit 150 before he fights on october 30th we've got a red numbered out of 275 uh so yeah i mean stop what you're doing right now if you're if you're watching us on youtube go hit the itunes reviews Go leave us one. Tell Gary how good he looks in his Knicks hat. Tell him how good the Knicks are going to be this year. And, uh, and and just tell us what you guys want to see out of the content going forward. That's all That's all we ask out of you. So we really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, UFC, I, I'm, I'm very excited about the UFC and what we've got coming up. Uh, UFC 267, as I mentioned, October 30th. Got some incredible fights on that card. Peter Yan versus Corey Sandhagen. Islam Akachev versus Dan Hooker. Uh, yeah, you know, And then we've got our boy. We've got our boy Kamzat Chimaev as a minus 400 favorite versus Lee Jing Lang. And, I mean, he's going to smash this dude, and, and then he's going to be a front runner for the strap. So we'll see how things go, man. I'm really excited about the UFC coming up. Even after that, UFC 268, we've got Kamara Usman versus Colby Covington. Uh, Rose Namajunas versus Zhang Wei Li. I think that's number three for them in, in Rose's title defense there. Justin Gaethje versus Michael Chandler. We've got a ton of big names is the point as I keep rambling on here about the UFC. A ton of big names. I think even as we're we're in football full swing, as NBA is going to be up and running at that point, like I think the UFC uh, sports card market is, is going to start picking up a little bit as we start getting these names in the ether every weekend. And and I think it's just a great time to be buying right now. So if, if you don't want to buy, it's a great time to review on iTunes and just get these cards for free. Yeah, you know what? I'm taking a look at some recent sales right now. The UFC Prism and Select card market is strong. I think it has. I you know this is just my 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 general take, my general opinion, but I actually think it's gonna has have a real long lasting appeal. It's got it's an international sport, as Cody has mentioned here before. Um, a lot of fun personalities, a lot of people that are interested in it. the hobby boxes of both of those types of things have only gone up. That's usually a good sign. We saw the same thing in F1. So this is a real legit giveaway, everyone. You know, as we talk about Comzat as being one of the premier. 
fighters in this sport. So we'd really appreciate it. Go help out. You can talk about hey, how good I look in my my hat, but you could go look, check out YouTube. I didn't even mention this to Cody. I mean, look at this fresh cut this kid has. He usually, usually comes on with a, a, a hat on as well. But I mean, what a haircut. <laughs> what a face. Uh, what a guy. I mean, two great looking gentlemen talking about sports cards. It doesn't get much better than that, guys. You love to see it. Go go check it out on YouTube too, because I know a lot of you guys are here for for just the audio, but you're missing out on half the experience if you're missing out on our beautiful faces. So appreciate the shouts there, Gary. We <laughs> we want to try and tease another giveaway here because we've got our friends at Dibs. Uh, they've been doing a lot for us. They're helping us out, giving us some data behind the scenes to help out with their platform. And as we've mentioned with Dibs, if you want to trade buy, sell fractional shares in high-end sports cards, and you want to do it 24-7, you want to offload positions immediately when a player has a big game, you want to be on dibs. Their platform is incredible. Gary and I, uh, along with Adam Levitan, did our draft just a few weeks ago. We're going to go over some of my draft picks that, you know, obviously we're crushing, as you would expect. But we're going to go over some of my draft picks here tonight. We want to tease a little giveaway. So if you guys have not yet signed up, go to dibs, sign up for account, Get your KYC, do, do the verification process. If you haven't deposited yet, deposit and then purchase some cards. And if you already have purchased cards, great. We want you to screenshot your biggest holding on the Dibs platform. So for me right now, my biggest holding is Patrick Mahomes. I think he's 18% last I looked of my total Dibs balance. Screenshot the player that is your biggest holding on Dibs. Send it to us at Collection ETR on Twitter. And we'll select one of our listeners next week uh, or or in the coming weeks, depending on how many submissions we get for some sort of giveaway. We'll see if we can partner with something with Dibs. Or if not, Gary or I will uh, we'll give away a slab. How about that, Gary? You, you want to give away a slab? You know what? I really do want to give away a slab. And as you mentioned, it's a great time for sports cards right now. All sports are heating up. So uh, I want to give away a slab to one of you guys. Shout it out. Shout t- uh, Go at Collection ETR on Twitter. Give us your biggest Dibs holding and we are going to hook you up. No, no doubt about it. Do you do you have the link in front of you? Can you give the people the link verbally? Because I'll tr- I'll continue to try and drop the links in the show notes. But my God, my brain is just uh, I'm an airhead most of the time. So if the link doesn't make it into the show notes, I do apologize. I've got a reminder to get myself. Gary, can you drop the link verbally for the good people that are listening to the show now? Yeah, yeah. Go sign up for dibs through our link. It's uh, dibs.app.app.link slash etc. So that's dibs.app dot link slash etc and that'll uh get you to the sign up page for dibs knows that you're coming through us which helps us out a ton and uh we really appreciate it dibs are a great partner dibs is a great site and it's just getting going dibs is going to grow uh, a lot and they're going to be adding a lot of amazing cards as new releases come out as players expand their portfolios uh to the site so yeah, a lot of good stuff over on dibs all right as mentioned we're going to get into my draft i think we did this on episode 19 if if memory serves uh we brought on adam Gary and I and Adam went through a five-card draft. We went over some of Gary's draft picks two episodes ago just to see how things were performing to start. Gary, if I could have you pull up the Dibs website and share your screen for everyone watching on YouTube. We'll go over some of my draft picks, starting with my third and final quarterback that I drafted, uh, Tom Brady. This 2000, Bowman Chrome, PSA 10. You guys left the, the the greatest quarterback of all time, the greatest football player of all time for my final pick uh, of our quarterback draft. And and he's up. He's up we 12% did. to start the season. So I, I don't know what you guys were thinking. He's the <laughs> safest investment in the hobby. 12.1% up to start the season. Uh, in, anything to add on Tom Brady's physical card market? Anything to add on Tom Brady's fractional card market as uh, the Bucks are red hot once again to start the season? No, we did. We 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 messed up letting him slide to you at the end of the draft. I guess you know us, uh, you know DFS guys, NFT guys, always just looking for the crazy delta. But let, then again, we just let the, the the safe investments, the sure things, just slide on by, and that's t- Tom terrific, Tom Brady. So um, you know, a little bit of a disappointing performance on his return to Foxborough this past Sunday night. Then again, still came away with the win. So you know, hard to doubt Tom. That's for sure. Um, you know, looking just over the last, you know, week or so for his physical space on card ladder, you know, that same card, either Bowman or Bowman Chrome, 
for PSA 10 is up. It's up about 5% over the last two weeks. So, you know, maybe a little bit of what we had said, a lot of hype, him coming out strong at the beginning of the season with his Bucks team coming out air raid, you know, strong. And obviously the hype coming up through that game in New England. And, you know, I would imagine they're going to be competing for the one seed all season long. I'd imagine he's going to be, you know, right up there with those 4,000 yard, 30 plus passing touchdown type of numbers. So, Tom doesn't look to be slowing down. This Bucks team is prolific. They have the weapons all around. And I think he is a continuous, going to be continuous to be a safe investment uh, throughout the season and obviously the for, through, you know, for the duration of his life, quite honestly. Yeah, honestly. I mean, if you're, if you're well, lucky enough to be holding on to Tom Brady physical cards, there's probably no reason to you know, really ever sell unless you're trying to liquidate. These things are going to continue to appreciate in value. Uh, they're not obviously making any more of them. This was a kind of a, a period of time in the hobby where, where things were scarce. You're not going to see a high pop count on Tom Brady's Bowman Chrome from 2000. Um, so there is one thing that I do want to mention, though, that has me a little bit concerned after their performance Sunday night. They lost another defensive back, and they're mm-hmm. down three starting defensive backs. Richard Sherman was out there after being signed on Wednesday, I believe, yep. and he did not look great no. uh, if you were watching the game. He was getting cooked by Kendrick Bourne, was getting cooked by Jacoby Myers. I am a little bit concerned about the uh, secondary of that defense, and I just am not sure with as many good young quarterbacks as there are in the league, with as many good high-powered offenses as there are in the league, that they've got the ponies to go back-to-back. If you find yourself needing to, if you've got fractional shares on dibs or some of the other, uh, you know, fractional marketplaces that we talk about with Rally or Collectible or Otis, if you find yourself in a spot where you need to liquidate, you want to, you know, get into some more uh, speculative investments, I, there's no problem if you want to offload some of your position in the season. I, if, if you think that there could be another buying window after the season, if they don't make another Super Bowl run then, uh, you know, I've got no problem with that. Am I crazy for wanting to potentially offload, take some profits off the table on any Tom Brady shares? No, I don't think you are, particularly on those fractional type of sites. I think if you're one of the lucky enough people to hold physical something, a card like what's on the screen here, you know, the I think I think I'm more hesitant to sell that than I am on fractional when you're not actually probably holding the twenty thousand dollars worth of one physical Tom Brady card that, you know, if you're lucky enough can have, you know, the MJ type of renaissance that we saw the 86 Fleer have this past year and maybe help your kid go to college one day. You know, I think that's a different type of just put it in the safe investment where on, you know, the fractional sites and you're trying to kind of have those more speculative uh, investments, you want to get in on some younger players, you have maybe a thousand dollars worth of Tom Brady. It's a different type of ball game. And I think it makes sense to maybe kind of sell out high at the end of the season where we might see some some uh, downstream coming from Tampa Bay, at least, um, you know, they might whether it's you think they may not reach their over win total this year or just the fact that they're kind of banged up and um, seemingly, you know, maybe heading down the wrong road from an injury perspective where it might impact some of Tom Brady's winnings, uh, you know, winning, winning football games. It, it makes sense to do that. All right. From the defensive injuries on the Bucks side to one of my biggest misses in my draft and completely on brand for me because I've been talking about Tua since the draft, since they drafted Jalen Waddell and added an offensive lineman in the second round. I was very excited about the pieces that they put around their young quarterback. Tua obviously was injured uh, early on in the season, appears to be headed towards a return, but has undoubtedly been my biggest failure to start my draft from the Dibs platform. So with the 2020 to a tag of Aloha, Panini Prism, PSA 10 is down 36.25% for me to start the season. So not great for my Delta, not feeling very good about that. But, you know, it's just it just kind of reiterates the point that we see the card market reflect what's going on in the real world. All right. Like Tua gets hurt. The Dolphins are are struggling. They just lost to uh, to my Colts. My my hapless Colts found a way to get a win, and you know we we see the the card market react. Uh, Tua Tua needed to show us something this year, and he can't do that on the sidelines. So, uh, is, is this is this a buying window now for Tua? Now that he uh, appears to be returning soon from injury, or you know should we should we just be holding and waiting? What, what are we doing with Tua at the moment? Yeah, I mean if I'm doing anything with Tua right now. It's either buying or holding, right? I don't think I'm selling at this moment where he's still on the shelf. He should be back in about a week and a half, two weeks. And, um, you know, it's there There's hasn't been many positive signs for Tua so far in his career, right? Obviously, we, we know the story of last year, you know, kind of the quarterback cutback committee coming off the injury. Um, but he didn't look so great to start this year either. Now, obviously, a small sample size. You know, it's always scary when when you go 
you know, you 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 are set on the shelf, down and out. Jacoby Brissett comes in, and then Vegas moves the line towards your team. Um, you know that always is not a great sign of what Vegas thinks of the player, um, which scares me just a bit. But I would say that at this point, he's got he's coming back. I believe he's coming back on what Schefter tweeted out to be October seventeenth against a game against the Jaguars. So if you think he's fully bad, fully healthy, coming back in a good matchup. Um, you know, maybe if you're in a you're holding to in a position, maybe you can have a game that is you know uh, encouraging and, and giving some positive signs for for Tua collectors coming out the gate in his return there. But yeah, you probably have about a ten day window here to do some Tua buying if you are still a believer. Now we are again. Remember, we're talking about one of the best college quarterbacks of all time. So you know that doesn't always translate to the NFL, but it's it's something. And you know, I, I'm not giving up on Tua yet. Uh, that that's for sure. Yeah, he is. He's definitely kind of landed uh, as as a very distant third in that class, maybe even fourth now behind Jalen Hurts. But uh, Justin Herbert has cemented himself as probably one of the best young quarterbacks in the league and may even soon flip narratives between him and some of the uh, very, very upper end of the names as we'll get to in our in our week four takeaways. Um, but yeah, I, 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 you've, you've always been the calming voice uh, on the show to help talk me off the two ledge when I get worried. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm holding any physical cards that I have, any of the you know higher end stuff that I've got on fractional sites, obviously still holding. Um, if, if I find anything that is worth buying, whether it, it be on dibs or whether it be via you know auctions on eBay, I'm definitely looking to to add to the to a collection as well. Still a big believer. Hopefully they can uh, he can get back and and the team can build something around him. We'll we'll see how things go in that respect. I wanted to talk about some of the skill position guys that we drafted because we've been very quarterback heavy uh, and rightfully so because those are obviously the biggest names in the hobby. But wanted to touch on my 2018 Saquon Barkley Panini Prism PSA 10 that I drafted from the running back side. And, and that position is up pretty substantially, up 39% to start the season. So uh, everything that I've lost on Tua, I've gained back on your boy and our boy Saquon Barkley. And, you know, we talked about it when when we went through the draft. Will he or won't he? Is he going to be the workhorse? Won't he be the workhorse? Well, it turned out in week one, and, you know, they kind of played this cat and mouse game in the offseason. He wasn't the workhorse. That quickly flipped. So Saquon Barkley, the last two weeks, has played on 117 of 134 snaps. He's had handled 40 of 43 running back touches and gotten 13 targets. So, right, this is the Saquon Barkley that we expected coming into the season. He's, you know, going to gonna compete for RB1 type caliber usage throughout the year. The the only concern, uh, you know, as as we can talk about in our in our week four takeaways with this team is that it's it's likely not going anywhere this year, right? The the schedule is going to get tough. They're they've you know they've only got one win under their belt to this point. So I'm feeling really good about having been right on the Saquon Barkley usage, uh, not necessarily out of the gate, but now through week four, feeling really good about where he's at from a usage perspective and and the fact that he's one of the best running backs in the league. But uh, definitely concerned about the team as a whole. How how should I feel about my Saquon Barkley shares being up thirty nine percent through week four? Yeah, you should feel really good about that. I mean, it's the most encouraging sign is to see Saquon back on the field and looking mostly like the Saquon we remember, particularly over the last couple of weeks. You know, this week, this week in particular, you know that that wheelbarrow down the sideline for the touchdown uh, it was so great to see it, being involved in the passing game. As you said, on the field for nearly one hundred percent of snaps. Yeah, it's gone pretty much according to what I thought. I thought they would ease him back in week one let them test out that that body into real NFL game action. If they pass the test, I, I expected them to give him the full workload, which is what they've done. And he's honestly uh, surpassed my expectations as far as kind of reaching back to that level that he was two years ago. Very happy to see, um, you know, obviously I'm more slightly optimistic about the giants after this past week, just from a, a macro perspective. Uh, and, which is it's exciting. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it when we talk about our other boy a, a little bit later on, but uh, as a whole, um, you know, Saquon, is I think in a good spot, in a good spot. And I think if you're looking to do any buying on Saquon, I would do it sooner than later because I expect, and even despite the hard get the hard matchups, you know, we've seen him obviously just um exploit a tough matchup in New Orleans this past weekend. I just think the volume will be there enough where he's going to put up his numbers. So I think as long as he stays healthy throughout the year, I think your buying windows for for what his price are going to be will come to an end soon. Yeah, agreed. And, and another guy that, you know, if, if you've seen his physical card market go up as well as his fractional card market, like we, we've seen on dibs, no no problem with taking profits off the table. And this is a guy, especially if you're getting the breaks around the same time Gary was, especially if you're getting back into the hobby around the same time Gary was, you might actually have some good Saquon stuff in your hands. Um, so, so definitely no issues taking a little profits off the table as he's looked like 
you know, one of the stud running backs in the fantasy realm and one of the stud running backs in the hobby as well. So kind of like kind of like that position where I'm at with Saquon Barkley. Definitely. One guy, well, last guy we want to get to here, just uh, to touch quickly on the wide receiver position, because I'm a big fan of investing in wide receivers at this point. Again, I think they're they're the second biggest name in the hobby, obviously behind quarterbacks. And I think as more people uh, that started in the fantasy football world, the people that started in you know kind of the NFT world now with the NFL Top Shot coming up, we'll talk about that in a second here. I think that that wide receivers are going to make a name for themselves in the hobby long term too. My boy DeAndre Hopkins was my pick at wide receiver. I stole your stack with uh, MVP frontrunner here, Kyler Murray. But the the DeAndre Hopkins tops Chrome Refractor in a PSA 10 is up 14.4% to start the season from week one. You know, Hopkins hasn't even put up huge numbers from, you know, fantasy, from fantasy realm, from box score. He's just been playing in this amazing offense that Cliff Kingsbury has not held back, that Kyler Murray is dominating. And I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Cardinals are the last undefeated team in the league still. Is that right? Yeah, they are absolutely the last four and O team with, uh, as you mentioned, the aforementioned Kyler favorite Kyler Murray favorite for MVP. So he's up 14.4% to start the season on dibs feeling really good about where I'm at with my Deandre Hopkins position. Uh, and, and, you know, another guy that we'll talk about too, in the, in our week four takeaways, Stefan Diggs, like these guys are going to have their big weeks. Yep. They're not going to be held uh, in check for the entire season it's just that the ball has been distributed evenly you know things of that nature that that we know we're going to run into with these offenses when teams game plan for them so i think there's even higher highs to be had for deandre hopkins as him and the cardinals look like front runners now um in the league they they look like an incredible well run team and yep. i i think we'll see a late season push for them and hopefully some bigger things coming come playoff time Yep. All, all I'll say on this one is, yeah, as you mentioned, I, Hopkins actually hasn't had a massive game yet. Diggs hasn't had a mention, massive game yet. Hopkins was dealing a little injuries, a cu- couple of tough one-on-one matchups with like Ramsey this past week. But, but this card particular, this one we're looking at in dibs right here, I love this card. Now I get, I get Hopkins is one of the Prism Tops Chrome mm-hmm. split guys, but visually, this card is much, much more, uh, much more attractive than the Prism uh, thirteen rookie that had the Prism, you know, big rookie. Uh, yeah. font across the bottom <laughs> and this i'm looking at it right now this uh value is about what you probably can get it for on ebay right now uh on card ladder it's similar but a pop of only 47 for the refractor so you can probably get this between 350 and 400 dollars if you can find it now again obviously it's a very low pop but that's the kind of investment i'm interested in that's a refractor so same as a silver but for tops and a very low pop for one of the top five to seven receivers in the league who might have a Hall of Fame trajectory, that is the kind of investment I'm interested in. Again, we talk about the silvers for guys like Metcalf and things like that. They're going to be higher than that at much higher pop. So, you know, give me something like this. That's an interesting card for me. Yeah, and you brought up a a larger macro point that we should mention on just dibs as a whole. Some of these cards are going to be more expensive to get a fraction of on dibs as they would if you were able to go out and buy the card. You know, if you you had $400, you might be able to find this card for $350 on eBay, whereas you might be paying a little bit of of a fraction of a price higher on fractional sites like dibs. There will be other times where you'll find this thing cheaper than you would get on someplace like eBay. So keep that in mind as you're transacting on Dibs' website. And again, as Gary mentioned off the top, and, and as I mentioned with, with doing an upcoming giveaway, go sign up if you haven't yet. And if you have signed up, consider sending us a screenshot at Collection ETR. The link again to sign up is dibs.app.link slash ETC. So go check it out. Give our friends some, at Dibs some love, uh, and, and I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right, let's let's switch gears hard here because we're going to get to some week four takeaways along with an MLB update as postseason rounds into form here. But I want to get your take on we actually got some news. Uh, we we kind of complained on last week's episode where we were talking Top Shot uh, and NFL's release. We haven't really gotten anything from Fanatics lately, uh, you know, since since they they dropped the bomb on us a couple of weeks ago. But we got some news finally out of Fanatics. Why don't you catch the people up on? on what we found out this week, or I guess last last week it was on Fanatics. Yeah, it's like we speak things into existence, right? <laughs> I mean, we we were talking we were talking on the pod last week about NFL Top Shot, which we'll follow up on again shortly here. But and I, I mentioned, I believe, at the end of the episode that I'm sure we'll find out news on this officially before we do on Fanatics. And then I think the next day, or over the next few days, we found out more official news on both topics. So uh, to my surprise, but yeah, Michael Rubin, CEO of Fanatics, came out, did a big hit on CNBC, then you know resulted in articles in the Wall Street Journal and different things about um, you know some of the real details about Fanatics' financial 
fina- uh, financials, some of Fanatics plans as far as their um, you know long term plans for the card you know industry and the hobby as a whole. So some interesting stuff here. Um, you know they do have fifteen year deals with the NBA, NBA PA, MLB, MLB PA. Uh, that is now confirmed. Um, a ten point four billion dollar valuation around their card business coming on the heels of a three hundred fifty million dollar Series A. Uh, round of funding, so you know, not not a surprise. Which to me is just a very good sign for the future of this hobby. If there's if if they're getting that kind of valuation with that kind of early funding, um, you know, despite Tops and Panini Pass probably falling out, despite you know the quote unquote fear of a bubble from the past couple of years, that stuff excites me because that means that there's real money that believes in the future of this industry. That's exciting to me. That's my favorite thing to take away from this for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, right. as we've talked about, you know, we get into the the speculation, but we actually have some news to kind of break down. And I think it, it'll still be a little bit of speculative because we don't know concrete uh, what what the plans are from Fanatics. But I think my biggest takeaway from the from the news that we got out of um, Michael Rubin and, and the Fanatics team was it really feels like they want to have a one stop shop for yep. collectors. So I think they even mentioned they want to have manufacturing, design, distribution of cards. They want to be involved in buying and selling grading, financing, breaking, storing. So like it, it just kind of gets sets up this feel that there's going to be this fanatic sports cards monopoly. Do you want to do you want to run through this one by one and just kind of yeah. get your general takeaway of what what it feels like or what we think or what we know that fanatics plans to do. So first, manufacturing, designing and distributing, right? That just makes it sound like they they're going to have their own cards. In some yep. form and let's right? let's let's start with that where there was a quote in there that you know Michael Urban did say that there's certainly a possibility that they could they would buy a current card maker mm-hmm. now whether that be Tops whether that be Panini whether that be Upper Deck whether that be all of them or or parts of any of them I think the only way they could really really pull that off to be doing all of their own of of that type of thing is if they did take the infrastructure up from from the ground up from one of those companies that really have it in place to do it properly from the get-go in 2025 26 i think that's the way it makes the most sense you add that on top of the fact that obviously they'd be interested in those companies from their brands um i think that is something that we really need to keep on the radar now so you know that's that's interesting yeah that's what that means it means you know the manufacturing designing that's one thing and i think that's where it comes in with with buying a company but the distributing is what's really interesting i think fanatics looks at this obviously they have the back end to be a dtc company right a direct to consumer company and i think they look at these distributors that are currently in place from panini and tops and saying why the heck do we need these people um we could do this all by ourselves and that is scary for a couple of different reasons. It's scary for obviously the future of distributors who make who've been making you know hand over fist profits over the past couple of years with the with this boom. But that trickles down to breakers because that's where they get their cards from, and trickles down to more to more concerning for me local card shops, which you know hobby shops that have been around for for generations. Um, you know, I would hope that they would like to to keep those types of things around. But again, we're talking speculation here. But if they are actually looking to do the, their own manufacturing, designing, distributing, that impacts all of those things. Um, you know, that would also, they also did mention breaking, which we'll get into a little bit of doing their own. Like that all ties in together. Um, and, you know, that that's, it's, I don't know if I want to say it's concerning because, you know, we just don't know how that this might actually shake out, but there's just no doubt about it. You can read that headline and not think that the future of distributors, card stores, and breakers are in trouble. Well, and we talked about all this, that the possibility of just going them going straight direct to consumer was within play. We, we knew that they had the infrastructure to be able to do that. Um, so, you know, if, if that's the route that they choose to go, it could go back to your point where you talked about someone like my son, who's three right now, who yeah. by the time this this deal goes through, I hope is is as interested in the hobby as I am. We get direct to consumer. We, we cut out the middleman. We cut out the profits. We might get these cards at, you know, a, a reasonable price at least. To some degree, for some of the products where where the stuff isn't uh, incredibly difficult to get your hands on, yeah, brings more reasonable number... than it is now. Exactly. Yeah. That brings up point number two because they did mention direct to consumer in in kind of their their news release multiple times. Buying and selling. Are they just going to have you know the the bringing up buying that obviously makes sense. You, you go to go to Fanatics to buy your cards. Selling. Uh, are they just going to have their own secondary marketplace? Or are they going to wipe out the uh, eBay of sports cards? Per se, I mean, what 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 do you expect in terms of that announcement that there's going to be buying and selling via Fanatics? Yeah, this one is the one that has the potential to impact me the most directly. That yeah. you know, basically, my my full time job is is selling through mostly eBay. Obviously, I have some direct sales, but um, 
you know, that is the one that is, is the most frightening to me, the most potentially exciting, scary, you know, it's, it's all those types of things when you don't know what change might look like. Um, obviously we've talked about Josh Luber being involved in this. He built out StockX, a very successful secondary marketplace, particularly for sneakers. They have attempted and, and do dabble in cards, particularly sealed wax. So they have an infrastructure there where cards are sold on a site um, You know that's in place. I would expect for them to be a big push on there for them to have their own version of a secondary marketplace. Now, similar to the way you look go on Panini's right now, and that's where you'd buy and sell your NFTs, I would expect you know, the Panini type of NFTs uh, or blockchain cards, I would expect it to look something like that at the beginning where you know, you can buy and sell sealed wax and just directly directly place it on there. I don't know how it would it would shake out for singles or or lots or things like that, where eBay just has such a stronghold on it. I wouldn't expect eBay to go down without a fight or go down easily, but I do think they will be heard from more strongly than just StockX is right now. What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I agree with you. And is this one of those things that they uh, announce and launch like the Panini NFTs and they hold a small portion of that right. resale market, but then a majority of everything else happens on eBay like it has for, for you know, for the end of time? Yeah. Uh, that would be one thing that I would be wondering about. And would it only be for, you know, Fanatics branded cards? Would it only be for new releases and, and stuff that's come out since Fanatics has taken over the li licenses? Or would it be for everything you know like would, would i be able to go and sell a 2012 panini prism on the fanatic site or would this just be something that's that's held only in its own underneath the licenses that fanatics has been granted i again we're getting into the speculation stuff but it is one thing that you you kind of want to know about that's interesting you know right like i don't know i don't think there's any way for panini or tops to prevent it necessarily but if they aren't bought up by fanatics you know could they really try to take some action to not see their brand name on their site right. type of thing you know like you would think that would be at least one thing that they would try to do to, to hold their value and hold their name so uh, I, I don't know how that would work legally or if that's even possible but that's a very interesting point you bring up all right, let's get into grading because I think this is kind of another big one. Like, uh, can you just do, are we just going to be able to do everything through fanatics and not, you know, not deal with the middleman, not deal with PSA and BGS and, and all of these other companies, I think is, is one of the biggest questions. And we're going to have plenty of time to dissect this and, and hopefully more time to get more concrete news, uh, as this is still a few years away. But, uh, this is one thing I didn't know. Michael Rubin is actually involved with a, a card grading company. Did you know that? I did not. I did so not. it's it's CSG, I CSG, believe, which which is has some CSG has some real fans. Um, I think that their their labels itself look like crap, but their their holders are supposedly beautiful, like the nicest okay. plastic that that is out there in the grading company. And supposedly their grading system um, is pretty transparent and not bad. So it is a grading company that has some fans and has some legs, but is obviously still kind of buried under at least the big three. I would call it number four in the hierarchy right now between uh, BGS, PSA, mm -hmm. and SGC. So obviously you have this guy, Michael Rubin, who is is involved with, at Fanatics, and then now you've got uh, him involved with Grading Card Company. Does it make sense for this marriage to happen? And, and if so, how does this actually come into play? What, what, what does a Fanatics Grading Company actually do for the hobby? So I, I think this actually goes, it might go hand in hand with one of the other topics we're about to talk about, and that is breaking. So I think that the way that this works most efficiently if they are interested in doing something like this, because they had mentioned that they are probably interested in, you know, every part of the hobby that includes breaking, which in, you know, sidebar that I wonder if that means that they're hiring breakers. Do they, do they straight up buy up breaking companies that have big names? Yeah. Um, I, you know, that's more speculation, but the only way I could see this really, really working where they can kind of take a piece of the pie of PSA or BGS is if you're breaking through them because they've monopolized that breaking corner because they cut out distributors and you hit a card that you want sent in right away. And you don't even have to receive that card. You could tell the breaker <laughs> or just press a button on your on the website of your card inventory and say, I want that going to grade, get graded by Fanatics Reading Company or CSG or whatever it might be at the time. And that is a way I think you could really eat into it because a lot of people get their inventory through breaking. Right. And then send it into to card graders or or, or uh, you know mass group entries of cards. If you could just do it right from the start, you know I had a breaker once grade a card for me just out of the goodness of his heart, and that was the best. I didn't have to do anything. He didn't send it to me. He just sent it to the grading for me because he had a submission ready to go, and I got it back fully graded. It was awesome. Uh, you know, shout out to that guy. He he knows who he is. But um, you know, it, it's that that to me is you know where that might be able to actually take a piece of that pie. Besides that, I don't see them interrupting that space so easily. 
not yet. I mean, now you've got the wheels turning. It's like, okay, so, so you go on, you, you buy it into a box or, you, you know, you buy into, buy a full box, you have it broke for you, uh, through fanatics, whether it's, you know, uh, companies that fanatics is partnered with or bought out or whatever the case may be. You hit a card, like you said, you get it graded. Uh, you, you, you can sell it, I guess, instantly on their secondary marketplace. If you want to, if they've got a secondary marketplace for cards, uh, you could store it as, as another thing that they mentioned, they talk about storage. You can just have it stored in their vault. Um, I mean, it, 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 them, yeah. them wanting to be the one-stop shop for collectors just kind of is starting to make sense with all of the things that they mentioned. You could hit, you could be in like a hundred dollar break, hit a thousand dollar card, grade it for a hundred bucks, put it on their site for whatever the $5 fee and make like an $850 profit without ever even receiving the physical card in your hands. <laughs> I'm starting to love this. Like, like, like you could. It's, it's possible. You know what I'm saying? Right. I, I think the change is going to be terrifying. And I think that, as you mentioned, like, especially with grading, the biggest thing for them to overcome is the stranglehold that PSA, especially, uh, and BGS, obviously, to a right. lesser degree, has on just the grading market as a whole, right? How are they going to steal that that market? And that's why all these pieces play into each other, you know, cutting out the right. distributors, cutting, and, and which in turn cut out the breakers. And if you take up that piece, that's the way you can infiltrate that market, at least from a small percentage you know, standpoint. Some people though might still only want to sell on PSA if they if the fanatic secondary market isn't built up enough. They might just want to receive those cards, grade them themselves through whichever grading company that they prefer, and and go about it the traditional way. They're going to try though. They're going to try to get a piece of every single place. As you yeah. mentioned, you know, storing, vaulting. You know, um, PWCC or you know, the Starstock, which I I I become a pretty big fan of. Um, Alt, all these companies that are up and coming that have good infrastructure and good backing and good funding. You know, those companies. You know, I, I hope they're not in trouble. But if if Fanatics is you know trying to to partner up with some of those or get their own vaulting game going, that's a big part of the the hobby now as well. So, it's um, a storm is a coming. It's a couple of years away, but it's a coming. Yeah. And all of this feels still very speculative, which, you know, <laughs> you it's hate fun, to though. just kind of be, it, it is fun. It's the funnest part of the hobby to talk about is, is speculating, whether it's, you know, it's actually speculating on players or speculating on what the hell is going to happen in the hobby in the next five years. But as you mentioned, we're going to have time to hopefully dissect this. We're going to get more news. Uh, things will become more concrete. Anything else you want to mention on Fanatics before we move on? No, I think we actually think that was a great conversation. We covered it. We covered it all. And listen, like, spe yeah, again, take everything we just said with a grain of salt. But what are podcasts right. for if not speculating? What are two <laughs> guys just shooting the shit going back and forth for if if not for speculating about the future of the sports card industry? I mean, I think that's what podcasts were actually born to do. So um, <laughs> it's literally what yeah. it was ex invented for. You have two guys in their basement who know absolutely nothing about anything, and about we're anything. just shooting the shit on on everything. So yeah, we that. think we, we think we know a lot about a right. lot, but we know nothing right. about nothing. That's right. That's exactly uh, yeah. right. Speaking of uh, knowing a lot, uh, no, no, knowing nothing about a lot, <laughs> <laughs> an MLB update. Would you? Would you That's please? A good transition. Would you please take over for me for a second again and, and give the good people an MLB update now that we're officially into the playoffs? Yeah, I'll do it because I have to. But again, I'm still really burnt from tonight. So <laughs> um, I have a couple of buddies over. I drank a lot of wine tonight. I'm I have a headache. The Yankees lost, but uh, let's start there, I guess. So the Yankees lost. That means that the Red Sox of Boston and the Rays of Tampa, my two AL East foes, will play in the divisional series. Um, that one to me is the least exciting from a card perspective. A couple of young names on both teams, but none of them that have a super, super strong hold on the in the hobby um xander bogarts is a guy shortstop on boston that i'd be looking to invest in he has just been for whatever reason criminally undervalued underpriced in the hobby um, let me see if i can get some real data in front of me while while i talk here to, to support that but i know that to be true i mean i sold the one of one dynasty card of his this past year for only 500 dollars. now for one of the top five young six young shortstops in the league i know 500 dollars doesn't look like a think like a number to scoff at for any kind of card but that a one of one dynasty patch auto uh for, for one of the top five or six young shortstops in the league should be much higher than that like you think about tatis that card would have been uh well into the clear closer to the tens of thousands of dollars so um you know he's someone to me that kind of like a, a older version of Bo Bichette that i just think is for whatever reason isn't getting the love you know if xander comes out on the big stage they upset the rays um get to the alcs he's one of their top two or three players just someone that you will see a slight bump and maybe he'll finally get that respect if he can somehow really kind of be an mvp of an alcs an mvp of a world series i hope and pray the red sox don't get there but he's the name i'm most interested in on the Red Sox. Uh, and then also uh, can't fail to mention Rafael Devers, 
who is probably their best overall player, third baseman, still a young kid in his early 20s. Um, you know, I like his Topps Chrome stuff out of 2018. You can get his uh, Topps Chrome for around 70, 75 bucks right now. Now that is uh, rising over the last couple of weeks as he's kind of geared up with this playoff run. Uh, but I think that can get up to a hundred dollar card in this playoff run here. If they, if they do go anywhere, he's a good player, power hitter, big market. We've talked about that a lot. So those are the two guys on Boston. I'm looking at on Tampa, you know, they're, they're just so hard to get excited about them from a card perspective. Um, you know, they're, consistently one of the best teams in baseball consistently been around or sniffing or in the world series yet it's a very small market which with has often been dominated by just overachieving good pitching and kind of small ball billy bean type of rosters being built for the hitting which doesn't result in much excitement from a card perspective the one guy to keep an eye on is randy rosarena who is kind of the darling of the playoffs last year you're going to see most of his rookie stuff in a cardinals uniform because that is where he was out of 2020 tops 2020 tops chrome i do think that there is some room there the 2020 tops chrome rookie card for him in a psa 10 is a very cheap card and the pop is still under a thousand. That is definitely the guy to take a look at. The pop right now is at 889. It is rising. It will get to a thousand at some point. But right now on card ladder, that's only valued at a $36 card with a 20 uh, 24% decrease um, over the last month or so. So wow. that's one that I'm, I'm, I'd be looking to buy and scoop up because I think the Rays win that series against the Red Sox at least make the ALCS, and I wouldn't be surprised to see them in the World Series again. So so if you know again, we only have a one year sample size of a guy like a Rosarina on the big stage, but we saw what they did in the playoffs last year. Yeah. Once I, you know, people said, it, I think A-Rod said it on the broadcast tonight or a version, you know, take out all the regular season numbers once the playoffs come in. It's a completely different game, completely different beast. People have, you know, different levels of, of clutch and just overall ability for the sniff for the big stage. People, it's a slower game, more pitching focused. Uh, and if he's one of these guys that can actually hit those big home runs on a big stage, you will see that $36 card double. I have no doubt about it. So that's the guy I'm looking to buy. I'm probably going to see what I can find on eBay actually after the show for Rosarena um, of the of some of his rookie stuff, maybe some of his rare stuff, rookie stuff because that's the one name on Tampa that I'm looking at for sure. Let me take a note before I forget. Okay, so we're buying mm -hmm. Randy Rosarena after, after the show. Yep. And then we're going to sell after he smashes or we're going to wait. That's right. we're gonna, no, I'm all right, selling. Exactly. I'll sell all after right. he smashes. I don't want to keep. Beautiful. This like, is the kind of investment advice that I like. I don't want to hold on to this shit for too long. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. like, I, he is a young power hitter. So, like, right. I, I don't mind holding some of it. But again, the Tampa thing scares me. Baseball is just such a grind. We're reaching that mm -hmm. offseason soon. Like, unless you really want to say we say we buy 20 Roy and Rose cars between us. And now we're not tying up so much money in that. But, like, it's not like I want to necessarily hold until the middle of next year when he goes on like a four game home run streak and I just try to find that you know what i mean like right. and not that many eyes are on tampa except for in the playoffs so it's really like a buy and sell within this month long period that's the way i'm looking at it for for someone like randy so what um, about a guy another guy on that same team uh wander franco what's what's been going yeah, on with sorry, his I, should, I should of course mention wander um you know he's the the exception to the rule i would say with this tampa team because he was the number sure. one prospect in baseball for so long about a two three year period and he really lived up the hype you know he had a little bit of a lull at the beginning of when he got called up then got injured then then came back and you know just went on an absolute tear i think you know uh, the on base streak he had uh of 30 some odd games just just unheard of and you know he's a baby still so you know the only thing with wander compared to a guy like rosarena is because of the hype his pops are so high right at least yeah. for the you know some of the the widely circulated stuff like that bowman chrome um psa 10. now we're talking a pop of that, just the regular, I'm just talking the, the straight Bowman Chrome, not refractor, not autograph. That's a pop of almost 10,000. So we're reaching that critical 5K figure number. We talked about it with Luis Robert two weeks ago. However, it's still holding strong as a $210 card. So here's what I would think with that, because that pop's just going to continue to grow. If Wander does it on the big stage, sell during the playoffs. If he is... You know, if he hits a couple of home runs against Boston coming up, which should have a lot of eyes on it that series, if they go on to face the Astros... Whatever it may be, if you feel it, if you feel that big run coming from a guy like Wander, if you have the highly circulated stuff, I'd sell during the playoffs. Um, some of that might also apply for some of the rarer stuff because it might actually reach numbers that are just you know too high if you need the liquid that you can sell off. So, uh, I, Wander's in a good holding spot right now, if you ask me. And you, we we bring up card ladder a lot on the show because they have such good data. It's very easy to you know visualize, very easy to use, and kind of understand trends of of cards. But they also have good data on population reports and population growth. And that wander card that you brought up, that that uh, Bowman Chrome in a PSA ten is up to ninety nine sixty six, almost going to crest that ten thousand mark. 
it's got a monthly percentage growth of 2.6%. That thing, uh, it's, it's a straight line up yeah. and it, it doesn't appear to be slowing down, especially as PSA gets through that backlog. So I, I think a good point by you, if, yeah. if that card does pop here in the playoffs, good, you know, good, good opportunity to sell. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think so. Yeah, you're looking at Wander and Randy and Devers and Bogarts, you know, the two, probably the four biggest names or the two biggest names on each side from a hitting perspective. Those are the guys I'm looking at in that series. Uh, let's see where it goes. We'll touch base on it again next week. Um, the other AL series that's already set in stone starting up on Thursday, I believe, Astros, White Sox. Um, not too much here. I'm going to save the White Sox for a little bit next week because we talked at length about Eloy and Robert. Uh, who are the two big names really to keep an eye on there in the previous episode that we talked about baseball. So I want to see how they're doing against Houston before I talk about them. My thought on them right now is if you hear this tomorrow, right before the, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, right before that series starts up, and I would actually be looking to sell at their peaks right before the season, this series starts is if, if you are looking to move, but I would actually rather just see a wait and see approach, as I mentioned two weeks ago, see how they do on the big stage. Now, again, that could, that can that wait and see approach could be short lived, right? It could be mm -hmm. swept by the Astros and you might have missed your window. So go with your gut, go with your intuition on guys like Robert and Eloy. But, um, you know, if you bought early in the season when both those guys were hurt and you were looking for those selling windows, you know, you probably are going to run out of time shortly. So that's why I say I'd probably be looking to sell on the hype of them entering the playoffs. The Astros are a more interesting case. I'm going to be quick on them. Jordan Alvarez is the guy I'm interested in most. I think it's pretty clear that the Bregman and Altuve guys are just still feeling the remnants of the trash can cheating crap that I hate them for as they just haven't seen those markets really, really take back up. Um, you know, they are some of the best players in baseball. There's no doubt about it. I wouldn't be surprised if they make a run to see them rise once again, but I'm kind of just letting them be until they get further in the playoffs, which I do expect them to do. But a guy like Jordan, who wasn't really necessarily a part of that, who was a rookie in 2020, um, I'm interested in some of his higher end stuff because I think it's criminally undervalued. Here's a card I have here. Um, this is a Luminary. He's one of the higher end patch autographs. This is his rookie card out of, uh, out of 15 on card auto with some really cool three color four yeah, color. Yeah, that's I a think, very patch cool patch. There. Yeah. So, you know, stuff like this to me is undervalued. It's only a couple mm -hmm. hundred bucks. I think last time I checked to, to maybe look to sell that. Um, so I just decided to hold because I think, you know, for one of the young power hitting lefties on one of the most dominant teams in baseball, I think he's just undervalued to this point. So that's somebody that I'd be looking to, um, you know, monitor his performance and, um, you know, just, just want to see how he does on the big stage, because you would hope to see if you are a holder of Jordan stuff, whose top chrome base, by the way, PSA 10, is only a $25 card right now. Oh, wow. 27, 2600, uh, 2600 card pop. Um, you know, just somebody that I'd be looking to uh, be investing in still. There, there's no doubt about it. So that's really all I'm interested in there. Let's hit NL very quickly. Um, a little bit less exciting. I still believe this from a hobby perspective over there. The Giants of San Francisco uh, wrapped up that one seed, and they are going to face the winner of Dodgers Cardinals. Now, the Dodgers just dominated the regular season as well, and because they were in the Giants division, have to play a one-game plan. That's a problem in its own right for baseball to figure out. I'm not going to touch on any Dodger or Cardinal right now because I just don't think it's fair to speculate. I'm going to assume the Dodgers move forward. If they do, I'm interested in guys like Corey Seager, Gavin Lux, Mookie Betts, the big names. Those are the guys to monitor. Let's talk. Giants quickly. Chris Bryant, probably the guy I'm most interested in. You know, we talked about him as one of the early 2010 decade guys. That was one of the biggest prospects in baseball, won a rookie of the year, won an MVP. Then his market kind of plateaued. Um, now he's on a new team with uh, a lot of fans as well, and maybe not as much as the Cubs, but a chance to kind of re spark that playoff uh, magic, that, that MVP type season that he had, I believe, back in 16 on one of the best teams in baseball. And he's really, him and Buster Posey uh, are, are their two kind of Hall of Fame caliber type players, both of whom. I'm interested in now Posey's a catcher that always kind of t uh, puts a cap on somebody's market, but he is one of the best catchers of all time. And if he can win one again, another world series, I really do think that catapults him into another class of this generation of player. I think you can see him um, kind of reach all time peaks of his cards coming up here. If that giants team does go on a run and Chris Bryant, somebody that I'm interested in buying early in the playoffs. If you think the giants can get past the Dodgers, if that is who they, they face um, any thoughts there on giants Dodgers, if we get that, if we get that game, no, I wanted to circle back on on White Sox Astros because those were guys that I was buying uh, yeah, during yeah. the injury dip, as we talked about, and I held on to a few of those. Um, you know, I think the the biggest pop in their pricing was was after they both returned from injury, both Eloy yep. and Lewis Robert. Um, 
but it, I, I think you bring up a really good point and something that I need to think about. I need to I need to probably list those cards now because I'm not really too interested in in holding them into the off season. So uh, I, I did I did scoop up a few both of the Bowman Chrome and the Topps Chrome and offloaded a few of those as they return from injury, but held on to a few just to see how things shook out. Looking at uh, DraftKings Sportsbook, it looked like the Astros were favored to win that series. Yeah. So I think if I'm being smart here. Uh, and as you mentioned, the the time to sell probably is now just to sell into that hype. And, it, you know, if they if they make it past the Astros and extend their their playoff run and I miss out on, uh, you know, a little bit of profit there because I sold too soon, I feel OK about that. I don't want to end up after they they're bounced from the playoffs, holding on to that stuff too long into the offseason while I could be buying up, you know, NBA as it's coming into season or or be buying up NFL dips and things like that. So yep. uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's exactly my point too, is, is you what you you mentioned an interesting phrase, which is buying into that hype. And that is exactly what you'd be doing. Like just look at the Eloy Jimenez 2019 tops Chrome pop of a little over 3000, but growing $47 card right now. But um, previously, as you said, they kind of real they, they were, you were able to buy low when they were injured. Mm-hmm. They really spiked when they came back. And then if you look at the last month, that card's down about 34%. However, yeah. if you look at the last two weeks, it's back up another 17%. And all that is, is is a strong end of the regular season and buying into the hype heading into the postseason. So yeah. you are you're able to now sell as that market's going back up. If you want to get off of it, you might not have too many more opportunities. Maybe you wait to see after game one. What if the guy hits a home run? You might or or do what do what we talk about. Have those drafts ready to go. You know, yeah, you know, there, there's a couple approaches you could take here. But you probably have another about a week, week and a half um, over this five game series. Uh, and maybe they surprise. Maybe they they go on another and, and beat the Astros, which I would love to see because I don't like that Houston team. But um, <laughs> you know, you, you you might you might have some more window there. But you know, you you got to um, take a conservative approach. I think if you're not looking to get stuck holding it into the off season. Yeah, definitely. We'll we'll follow up with baseball as the postseason rolls on, and definitely give yep. some updates on the teams remaining and, and some of the card markets remaining as well. But we want to circle back and kind of finish out the show with some NFL talk because we've been given our takeaways on on what's going on with the NFL market. There's obviously a lot of movement, primetime games. It's where the most eyeballs are right now. It's the most interesting sport right now. Um, there's a lot of movement. I mean, I, as, as you're looking through some of the sports card markets and some of the player markets, you just see a lot of rise and fall throughout the season, a lot of rise and fall with performances. And as things start to finally take shape, uh, MVP races are starting to take shape, which teams are actually contenders start to take shape. Uh, and then, you know, some some players that are uh, underperforming are, are starting to see their markets dip as people sell off. So why don't we start with uh, what we just saw Monday night? Justin Herbert took care of business against the Raiders. I think the Chargers are now in first alone in the AFC West, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but I mean, Herbert looks good. And you're starting to see kind of that rhetoric flip now in the national media, too. Obviously, he was uh, a guy that was very hyped, a guy that crushed uh, every statistical measure anyone had set for him as a rookie. But now you're starting to see him like really compared to those tier one quarterbacks and, and even a, a, a step above some of those guys. So curious what you have to say about Justin Herbert after his, after his Monday night performance. Yeah, you know, if you've been listening to this podcast long enough that I've been a Herbert believer, I bought into that Herbert hype. Obviously, the hobby also has been very excited about Justin Herbert since he kind of burst onto the scene. But um, I think he's for real, man. I really, really do. And if we are talking about him in that, you know, Mahomes, Josh Allen, Russell Wilson, whoever you want to call about a tier, you know, there's room for this to grow. Now, the scary part is with the stuff like the just the base PSA 10, that pop will also grow, but doesn't mean there's not room for that slow to grow. We've seen this with guys like Luca, right? 8,000, 9,000 type pop, yet still a six to whatever, a 600 plus dollar card. Even if it settles in around there, that's exciting for a very high, high pop card because he's a quarterback and he's a stud. Then you take it one step further, go back, you go to some of his lower end, you know, some of his shorter printed stuff or just even higher end stuff. And that stuff's just going to have plenty of room to go as we're going to still see it have room to grow with guys like Mahomes and Josh Allen or those guys as they win more MVPs and more Super Bowls. That's the thing with quarterbacks. The ceiling is very, 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 very high. And if he's one of those special ones, you know, it's the, there's there's so much room to go, which is why I'm hesitant to sell much of my Herbert, yeah. even while he's so hyped up right now, even while he's clearly the best, you know, year two uh, quarterback in the league. I'm hesitant because I do believe in it long term and I know what kind of ceilings quarterbacks have. Yeah, you mentioned his PSA 10 stuff, right? His his base stuff as pop counts are starting to creep higher and higher. Even as the pop count on that PSA 10 base card is approaching 2000, it's been relatively flat. 
Uh, and, you know, obviously, as PSA continues to work through their backlog, that thing's going to c- continue to grow. But it's settling in right around five hundred dollars. Hasn't been much movement, even as some of that, uh, you know, lower end base stuff has kind of fallen off, uh, even as the season's kicked off. But it's higher end stuff. So I looked at his rookie ticket auto in a PSA 10. That thing's up 13 percent over the past 30 days and 50 percent over the past nine months. So you're seeing the the you know, the hobby was already high. On this guy, the the stud from the 2020 class, you know, as we've talked about in the past, when when people are breaking this ultra modern stuff, when people are getting involved in the hobby, and these are the names that are hot, this stuff's going to carry value long term. But we're seeing it kind of reach new highs with someone like Herbert, and as you know, rhetoric changes, and, and as he kind of flips himself as you know a good young up and coming quarterback into a legitimate bona fide stud, I think we're going to continue to see those things reach higher highs. Yep. And we might be doing our first PSA reveal on the podcast next week. I have a bunch of high-end Herbert oh, coming baby. back. Oh, yeah, baby. I'm excited. All right. Let's 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 hope that stuff comes back and let's hope it comes back tens. But this Hell is going to yeah. be great. I, You know what? I've had enough of profiting off of your misery. I, you, we, We've seen the Knicks lose in Madison Square Garden to get eliminated. We've just saw your Yankees lose. I don't want to see a Herbert come back, a PSA 9 or something. Let's get some tens, baby. Don't worry though. You know why? Because because let, let's try, I don't know if this was in the 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 order that we have on our sheet here, but let's transition to a guy we both love that I think is gonna gonna ease some of both of our miseries because that's Daniel Jones, my friend. Yeah, that's, baby. That's our, that's our guy, Danny Dimes, who neither of you got neither of us gave up on. And maybe we're a little worried for a minute, you know, but neither of us gave up on. And uh, I think we are two very very uh, heavy investors and collectors in, in Daniel yes. Jones' market in his cards. Um, and I, I love what I just saw out of that guy in New Orleans this past Sunday. For, first 400 yard game, uh, looked like an absolute pro, stepping up into the pockets, making plays downfield. We know what he does with his feet. Um, if you give him time, he's cut down on the turnovers. Jason Garrett has not been a hindrance over the last couple of weeks, um, at least you know between this game and the Washington game. And uh, there's exciting stuff there. And and I think there's a lot of reason for optimism, uh, despite the tough schedule coming up, which I know you wanted to you know you want to touch on. Yeah, it's so here's the thing with Daniel Jones. And like, I think if we're in at this point, we're kind of in for the long term. Now, you know, maybe there's there's short term windows. I don't know if it popped back up to a point where I would even feel comfortable selling after that 400 yard game. But I think going into the season, I just wanted to see Daniel Jones show me as someone who's invested in him heavily enough for him to be given another shot. I the, the Obviously, the worst thing is if this team goes out and drafts another quarterback, gives up on him entirely. Uh, and he hasn't been the problem for this team, as you know, Not this year. He's He's been very very good yep. uh throughout so I, that's, even, that's the Dem- even the denver game week one was not his yeah well you know it wasn't a great daniel jones game but it was a fine daniel jones game and every game since then weeks two three and four has been a good or great daniel jones performance so um there's there's a lot to like there and at the very least what he's shown and let's see if we can keep out again we're still very early in the season we're not even technically with the 17 weeks we're not even a fully a quarter of the way through but um what we are seeing is some people some quarterbacks take that year two leap mm-hmm it looks like we might be getting a year three leap from Daniel Jones when everyone in the world doubted him. And guys like us, me as a Giants fan and a Daniel Jones collector, and you just as a Daniel Jones collector and Daniel Jones fan, you know, this is great. I love seeing all these uh, media pundits eat their words. I hope it continues. <laughs> uh, I really do. And, you know, look, the schedule is not going to be great from a winning perspective. It might not be great. But I'll tell you this. That team showed me a lot this past week because I thought they could just lay down and die again this season, have another four to five, six win season and show no heart. But you know what? Judge has them competitive. I don't know if I love him from an in-game coach. You know, this is going to get very Giants fanny weedy, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, he has them competitive and and caring every week. If you look at that locker room and the camaraderie, they they want to go out there, they want to compete, and maybe they unlock something this past week. If their offensive line can hold up just a bit, I think we'll see them be more competitive than people think moving forward here. And this is someone that has not been optimistic on the Giants at all. You 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 know my my thoughts on how what this last decade has been right. on this team. But you know, listen, division games, you never know. They can go any anyway. And then even to look at, at the other other games in that schedule, the Rams, Panthers, Chiefs, Raiders, Bucks, all coming up. Chiefs can be completely exploited through the air. The Rams, we just saw what Kylo just did to them through the air. Um, the Panthers, we just saw what Dak did through them through the air. The Raiders, we just saw what Herbert did to them through the air. The Bucks, you know, th- that's that's a little bit more of a tough one, but still, they 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 are more of a, a, a you know dangerous against the ground. Those are all games that Daniel Jones might still be able to put up numbers, especially if game script goes his way where they get down. All I'm saying is there are maybe still some buying windows on Daniel Jones here, but I do think if you are like us. You know, th- th- your your stuff's going to go up this season. There, I, I just don't think there's a way yes. around it unless something really bad happens, which I'm happy, which I'm happy about. 
I, I'm with you, and, and you brought up a good point because I was nervous about the schedule because they've got one of the toughest schedules from just a win-loss from perspective. NFL perspective, but, there's no doubt. Exactly. But I think you bring up a really good point. The narrative may just simply shift that Daniel Jones is no longer the problem, and now it's time for ownership. Now it's time for the GM. Gettleman. Now it's time for right. Gettleman. Yeah, get out of here. And now it's time for you guys to build a contender around this guy who has shown that he can potentially be a franchise quarterback. Because he, that's, that's truly what he's been to start the season. It, yeah. and, and if the narrative shifts, even in uh, as the win-loss record looks awful, that's something that's great. It, it gives ownership another reason to believe in this guy for at least another year. Maybe put some offensive line pieces around him. He threw up for 400 yards last season, uh, last week, without Sterling Shepard, without Darius Slayton. Uh, the fact that he was able to do that without those weapons that we talked so much about this offseason uh, was incredible to me. So now I'm starting to feel like the New York Giants fan of the podcast. But I love Daniel Jones. I'm I'm been more encouraged, even though the record hasn't shown it, than I thought I would be, honestly, to this point. Because every dollar that I had invested in Daniel Jones, I kind of just assumed was was going to go bye-bye but uh no he's been he's truly not been the problem he's been very very good to start the season exactly exactly um you know he's he, yeah that that's the move get rid of gettleman you have two first round picks coming this year one of them is the bears yours and the bears record wise should be in the top 12 ish probably draft the two draft two of the best offensive linemen available at those picks yep. that's that's the answer period you have and andrew thomas is starting to look good by the way he looked he looked solid down the stretch last year he looked very good you know, against a tough defensive line in this game, a very, very good best, best Andrew Thomas game of his career, best Daniel Jones game, maybe of his career. And let's see that continue. We'll get those offensive line pieces around him. Just again, continue this trajectory. We're sound like a broken record here, but it's positive signs for our guy, Daniel Jones. Note about, note about it. We have plenty more we can talk about NFL, but I think let's save it for next week because th these storylines are just, they're, they're, they're not going anywhere. I got to hit on one guy real quick because, yeah, yeah we're, we're already running long. I've been uh, – I, I happen to get reminded about Ryan Tannehill, a guy that you were interested in when we did our draft. I think he's on our best ball team, which, side note, we should we should follow up on that best ball team, see how that's doing, see if we're uh, live for a million dollars at this point or not. I think we are. Anyway, anyway uh, Ryan Tannehill was a guy that we drafted, I believe, and a guy that you were in on from his card market. The season was not great to start. They got wrecked by the Cardinals. They just lost to the hapless Jets. Uh, didn't look great, 27-24 in overtime. But but I was reminded of my of your obsession with Ryan Tannehill in the offseason and my affinity for Ryan Tannehill coming into the season as well. There's it, It's really tough for his to imagine his price falling any lower than it already has coming off that loss against New York. I was getting his PSA 10s for like $112, $120 just recently on eBay. Um, you know, they've, they've got the league's easiest remaining schedule per PFF. They've got a 66% chance to make the playoffs. Julio Jones and AJ Brown is going to be back soon. Uh, there's no reason for me at this point to completely panic on Ryan Tannehill. And in fact, I'm flipping the script. I'm using this as a buying window for Ryan Tannehill. I think that they're going to be competing in games come December come January I think that they're going to be making a playoff run I don't know how long it'll go but I think there will be a selling window if not uh, at the end of this season maybe into next year but I'll be looking hopefully the the stuff that I just bought at, at an all-time low in recent terms for someone like Ryan Tannehill I'll be looking to offload some of that come playoff time maybe before a wild card game or something like that but just wanted to mention Ryan Tannehill if you see that stuff out there super cheap after they probably just put up their worst performance that they will all season uh I, I'm definitely a buy on that right now well you know me and you were on the exact same page of that I didn't realize that it had gone that low I'm gonna go take a look right super now myself low. see what I can scoop up over the next week because uh I'm a believer in Tannehill I'm a believer in that passing game let's get AJ Brown back let's get Julio back let's get that thing going again their defense is bad just straight up bad, which is good for trying to hold numbers probably uh, for the rest of the year. And I'll say this, my favorite bet of this coming week is the Titans minus four and a half in Jacksonville coming off a loss to the Jets. I don't think Mike Vrabel will let them go out and do anything short of dominating that game, especially when you're coming off the, the Urban Meyer distraction in Jacksonville. <laughs> I get it's a, I get it's a division game on the road. Uh, you don't love laying points in those situations, but if you're a gambling man, trust me, I think the Titans go out and dominate that one. I think that is a great place to leave the people. Lock it up. You said it was Titans minus four and a half. I'm seeing four and a half right now. Yeah. All right. Lock it up. Titans minus four and a half. Buy all the Ryan Tannehill cards you can get your hands on. Buy all the Daniel Jones cards you can get your hands on. We had so much more we wanted to talk about on this episode. I had no idea we were going to go this long, um, but we'll be As back we next week. Yeah, we'll be back. You know, we we want to talk. Uh, we wanted to kind of recap NFL Top Shot thoughts. Uh, as as that's going to get into full swing, we, we, we really with with NFL Top Shot, we want you guys to be prepared when 
the the drops go live, when the marketplace goes live, we want you guys to know what you should be trying to get your hands on. So hopefully we'll have more information as that comes out. But also, as we've alluded to plenty on this show, NBA season is right around the corner. So we want to get some NBA talk, some final uh, you know, off-season buys. I know, Gary, you've been busy buying this off-season. I've been busy buying this off-season, guys, that I'm excited about this coming season. So we'll be back next week with some more NBA talk. We may even do a quick best ball draft, talk through some of our guys as we did with the NFL season. We'll touch on NFL top shot or, you know, whatever they, they decide to call that NFL times dapper, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever the product name will be. But we're going to get you guys caught up on everything you need to know around the hobby. I appreciate you guys for being here. Another uh, hour plus long show, but uh, we, we we try and keep it fun for you guys and it rolls on for us. Hopefully it, it rolls on quickly for you as well. Uh, you know, say a quick prayer for Gary tonight as he <laughs> puts his, his Yankee season to bed and hopefully this next season goes better for him. Great for start. Gary, for Gary, I'm Cody. We'll see you next week. Enjoy week five.